fate. A series of uncontrollable events which lead our lives in a very different direction to the one we had planned. And whether it is guided by God's will, supernatural power, or simply chance, fate drives us towards a new destiny. A future that feels unwritten, but it's the way our life is meant to be. Life is full of unexpected twists and turns. And no matter how hard we strive to succeed with even the simplest of tasks, nothing is ever easy, as fate throws us a dirty curve, forcing us into impossible situations and testing our health, wealth, skills and sanity. Fate may seem unfair. It makes the useless famous, the ignorant important and the rude respected. And then sometimes, it forces two strangers together for the sole reason that one is destined to become a serial killer and the other to become their prey. By the beginning of 1953, a decade after his killing spree began, Reg Christie had nothing. He was penniless, starving and ill. Trapped in a lonely flat, surrounded by his souvenirs, memories and eight bodies, with two in his garden, two in the alcove, one under the floor, two in a cemetery, a decapitated head in a mortuary, and an innocent man executed by the state for the murders that Reg Christie had committed. And yet, with his sadistic urges growing, he prowled the cafes of West London, looking for his final victim. But they would never have met had fate not forced them together. Some of what follows is based on the killer's own memories and perspective, so what part of this story is true is up to you. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, this is Murder Mile, and I present to you part 9 of the full, true and untold story of the other side of 10 Rillington Place. Today, I'm standing outside of what is locally known as the Hammersmith Apollo at 45 Queen Caroline Street in Hammersmith, W6. A 10 minute stroll from Peter's Snack Bar at 240 Goldhawk Road and three tube stops south of 10 Rillington Place. Although its current incarnation is as the Aventim Apollo, a name which no one calls it, the Hammersmith Apollo was built in 1932 as the Gaumont Palace, a three and a half thousand seat cinema and theater, three stories high, 200 feet wide, with curved Art Deco columns and its original Compton pipe organ. Ooh. As one of London's premier music venues, which has hosted a wealth of musical legends, outside every night, you'll spy long lines of fans, whether a gloom of goths, all trying to look individual, but identically dressed, a rabble of rockers, who assume that rock and roll means to smell like cheap cider and cheesy watsets, a sleaze of fat old men, all squeezed into Ziggy Stardust Lycra onesies, a drone of 10 year olds all wearing Ramones t-shirts with no idea that they were a band and not a clothing brand. And a flush of middle-aged women all drooling over their boy band crushes who've recently reformed to cover the cost of their hip replacements, false teeth, wigs, corsets, butt tucks, moob reductions and colostomy bags. And yet, it was here, outside of the Gaumont Palace, that 27-year-old Hectorina McClellan would meet Reg Christie, two unlikely strangers who fate had forced together. Great plumes of steam formed as his warm breath hit the cold winter air and as the constant stream of condensation ran down the dirty bedroom window and dripped onto the cold wooden floor. His one comfort was Judy, his mongrel dog, who shivered beside him, all cold, 
lean and hungry. The room was empty. The walls were bare. The bed and mattress were gone. Having abruptly resigned from a well-paying job at British Road Services a few days before he had murdered his wife, and struggling to survive on benefits of two pounds and fourteen shillings a week, he had pawned Ethel's possessions, sold most of his furniture to Robert J. Hookway for twelve pounds, and now, being a stone lighter and three shades paler, fifty-four-year-old Reg Christie slept on a thick pile of old clothes. For the umpteenth time that night, Reg winced in pain, as the lumps and bumps of his makeshift bed played merry hell with his fibrositis, and his tossing and turning contorted his dicky tummy into knots. Huffing with discomfort, Reg slunk into the kitchen and warmed his frozen fingers by the tiny flickering fire, having used the last few clumps of the coal in his scuttle. As with a series of ahs, oohs and ouches, Reg slowly lowered himself into the deck chair, his striped pyjamas torn and his slippers tatty. Being weak, hungry, ill and six months away from death, Reg should have been focused on food, sleep and medicine. But as he sat beside the kitchen alcove, with his sinuses rattled by a winter cold, still his stuffy nostrils stung with the acrid stench of strong disinfectant, as the corpses of Rita Nelson and Kathleen Maloney rotted barely a few feet away. And although, in his trembling hands, he held a small metal tin of Lewis and Burroughs' G's Linctus pastels, having eaten every lozenge, slowly he felt better as he leered inside the box and grinned. By most accounts, Hectorina McKay McClellan was a good woman. Being born on the 18th of February 1926, just before the Great Depression, between the austerity of two world wars, and raised in Grove Park Street, a tough part of Glasgow, life was hard. But blessed with two supportive parents, William and Marion, three protective brothers, Robert, Donald and John, and two loving sisters, Benjamina and Annie. No matter what life threw at her, Hectorina would thrive and survive. Known as Ina, Hectorina dreamed of marriage and babies, eager to mirror her own parents by being a good mum with a proud dad, a stable home and a family who stuck together through thick and thin. With a soft Glaswegian lilt, a youthful face, and being five foot four inches tall. Although her cigarette-stained fingers often shook with bouts of anxiety and depression, and her slightly crossed eyes gave the impression that she was simple, Ina was a sharp cookie, who being sturdily built, was no pushover. So, as a woman from a strong family, living 340 miles away in Scotland, who was naturally cautious, morally decent, and was never too proud to ask for help. Although she had a limited education, no skills, and would live a life reliant on a husband, with no criminal record, drink or drug issues, and no history of sex work, there was no reason, at all, why Ina and Reg should ever have met. But they did. In 1941, age 15, Ina was living with a handsome Burmese serviceman called Kin Wang So Hua, who was posted at RAF Middle Wallop in Portsmouth as part of Number 10 RAF Group, defending the south coast of England from the onslaught of Nazi bombers during World War II. As a military wife, although life on the base was routine and drab, with an endless procession of meals to make, uniforms to starch, boots to polish, and a baby daughter called Marion to raise. Unlike in the big city, here she was well protected, well fed, debt free and happy. 
Ina had everything she ever wanted: a home, a husband, a baby, and love. In 1948, Ina's parents, William and Marion, and her siblings, Robert, Donald, Benjamin, and Annie, all except John, who had joined the navy, moved from Glasgow to 153 Warwick Road in Earl's Court, West London. With her husband Kin being posted to Cardiff in Wales, to give her eight-year-old daughter more stability, Ina moved in with her parents, two and a half miles south. Of Rillington Place, being five months pregnant with her second child, Ina and Kin were married. And on the twenty-fourth of January, nineteen fifty-one, Juliana was born. It should have been the happiest year of Ina's life, but with her husband's career blooming, their relationship strained, and their new baby being white and Western. Not mixed race like Marion. At the end of 1951, Kin had returned to Burma, and Ina didn't join him. She could have, but she didn't. Ina was a single mother with two young children and an estranged husband overseas who no longer supported them, so she lived on handouts from the National Assistance Board. And although she stayed under her parents' roof, surrounded by siblings, and worked for eighteen months as a nanny to Alex and Florence Baker's four-year-old child, a wage of just one pound per day simply wasn't enough to survive. In October 1951, eager to make a better life for Juliana and Marion, her parents moved out of the smog, grim, and decay of the big city. And headed to Auchnasheen in the Highlands of Scotland, a tranquil village amidst the rolling hills, bubbling streams, and the crisp fresh air. But Ina didn't join them. She could have, but she didn't. And with her husband gone, her children gone, and her family gone, lacking any purpose. She sunk into a deep depression, and fate pushed her into the path of Reg Christie. I met a couple coming out of a cafe in Hammersmith, if I remember rightly. They said they'd been thrown out of their digs and stayed for a few days. A few days later, the girl came back alone. I advised her not to. She was very funny about it. I got hold of her arm and tried to push her out. She started struggling, and some of her clothes got torn. She sort of fell limp as I got hold of her. She sank to the ground, and I think some of her clothes got caught around her neck in the struggle. I then pulled her onto the deck chair. I felt her pulse, but it wasn't beating. The last nine weeks of Ina's life are a bit of a mystery, but this is what we know. Without warning, on the first of January, nineteen fifty-three, Ina vanished from one hundred and fifty-three Warwick Road. Reported missing at Kensington Police Station, she was tracked down and returned home. But by the second of February, she had disappeared. That was the last time her siblings saw her. And they stated that she had no reason to leave. Being depressed, single, and gripped by loneliness, Ina had eloped with forty-one-year-old unemployed truck driver, ex-convict, and married father of one called Alexander Pomeroy Baker, whose four-year-old child Ina used to babysit for one pound a day. Although happily married to his wife of sixteen years. With five kids and a house in nearby Pembroke Close, over that Christmas, Dorothy uncovered the affair. She booted her husband out, and Alex and Ina moved into a furnished flat at Number Four Oldham Road, not far from Ladbroke Grove. 
Ina was desperate for a return to the happy family life she had lost. But with spats frequent and money tight, their love nest was short-lived. And two weeks later, Alex moved back in with his wife and kids. Over the next few weeks, Ina slept rough, whether by crashing on friends' floors, dossing in doorways, or huddling in the passageway of her former boyfriend's home. At the end of January, Ina was spotted in Holland Park by 40-year-old Frank Ernest Collier, also known as Ron, an old friend and a criminal with five convictions for burglary, who Ina had confessed to Reverend Arthur Shaw that he was the real father of her daughter, Julianne. Shocked at how awful Ina looked, with matted hair, broken nails and a dirty face, both being broke with nowhere to stay. They slept rough, lived off the proceeds of his crimes, and it is implied that Ina turned to prostitution. Valentine's Day 1953, in the all-night milk bar in Notting Hill Gate, Ron and Ina were supping cups of tea when Ina's face flushed red. As across the counter, a small, bald and bespectacled man stared at her. Visibly shaken, Ina said, I think he knows we're talking about him. He's a chap I had some trouble with. He, he gave me an unpleasant time. And yet, with Ron beside her, the man never spoke to her or approached her. One month later, Ron would identify the man in the old night milk bar as Reg Christie. On the 18th of February 1953, having demanded cash in exchange for the safe return of property that he had burgled from a house in Acton, Ron was arrested in Hyde Park and Ina fled. Being sought by the police and with Ron in Brixton prison, feeling unsafe as a single woman, Ina went back to Pembroke Place. And once again, Alex deserted his wife and five kids and ran away with Ina. From Sunday the 22nd of February 1953, across the next 10 days, Ina and Alex stayed at the home of Ivor Elliot, a friend of Alex's at 35 Hetley Road, a road between Shepherd's Bush and Goldhawk Road. Having outstayed their welcome, on Monday the 2nd of March, Ina revisited Reverend Arthur Shaw at the Hind Street Methodist Church W1 and asked for help but he turned her away. And although she still had Alex to protect her, once again, Ina was homeless, penniless, depressed, and pregnant. Not very long after that, I met a couple coming out of a cafe in Hammersmith, if I remember rightly. The man went across the road to talk to a friend, and while he was away, she said that they had to give up their digs at the weekend. I told her that if they hadn't found anywhere, I could put them up. They both came and stayed for a few days. When they left, the man asked me if they couldn't find anywhere, could they come back for the night? I agreed to help them out. The girl came back alone. At least, that was Reg's version. But of course, the truth was different. On Friday the 24th of January 1953, outside of the Gormont Palace, having spied the couple through a steamy window of an unnamed cafe, Eves dropped on their chat and waited until the female was alone. Reg approached Ina and made her an offer. By the time Alex had returned... Reg was gone. As agreed, on Tuesday the 3rd of March 1953 at 7.30pm, Reg waited for Ina outside of Labrick Grove tube station. His hopes were high, having lured her here with a promise of a place to stay. But upon seeing that she was accompanied by Alex, 
His face turned to thunder as Reg bemoaned, I told you not to tell anyone about the flat. Not even your husband. I don't want lots of people making inquiries. Alex had scuppered Reg's plan to get Ina alone. And being taller, younger and fitter, he knew the burly man could easily overpower him. But being so close to his prize and feeling intellectually superior to the 40-year-old truck driver, Reg knew he needed to drive them apart so he could have Ina to himself. Having mellowed, Reg gave the homeless couple a brief tour of Ten Rillington Place. It wasn't ideal. The flat smelled bad. The tenant was a stranger. Almost all of the doors were locked. It only had one bed, made out of an old pile of women's clothes. And the twelve shillings and nine pence a week rent was too pricey. But being a good Samaritan, Reg offered them a place to stay for a few nights. Alex was unsure. He didn't like Reg. He didn't trust Reg. And the feeling was mutual. So having thanked him for the offer, Alex and Ina left Rillington Place and headed back to Ivor Elliott's in Hetley Road. With the rain heavy, the streets dark, and the icy wind cold, they arrived back hoping to dry off by the fire, nab a bite to eat, and nod off together on the sofa. But with Ivor, not wanting to be rudely awakened at the midnight hour again, with the door bolted shut, the couple were locked out. They had two choices. Sleep rough on the cold street, or head back to the warmth of Rillington Place. Arriving at roughly 2am, although he wasn't expecting them, being dressed in his torn striped pyjamas and tatty slippers, a sleepy Reg welcomed them in, and by all accounts, he was pleasant and hospitable. Having no spare beds or sofa, with Ina in the deck chair, Alex on the stool, and Reg perched on the coal scuttle, slowly drying by the warmth of the fire, that night they sat, chatted, and drank tea. And there they stayed for three nights, as guests of Reg Christie, and yet only one of them was truly welcome. On Friday the 6th of March 1953, at 9.30am, with his rations run out, money short, and needing to sign on, Reg, Ina and Alex left Rillington Place and went to the National Assistance Board by Goldhawk Road. For whatever reason, Ina agreed to meet Reg back at his flat at 12pm. She didn't say why. She agreed to meet Alex in an unnamed cafe on the Uxbridge Road at 3pm, but she never showed up. And later that evening, having returned to Rillington Place, Reg reassured Alex that Ina wasn't there. He showed him the rooms, offered him a cup of tea as he sat in the deck chair barely a few feet from the alcove, and feigning concern, Reg spent the next few hours with Alex, conducting a fruitless search of Shepherd's Bush in the hopes of finding Ina, who Reg already knew was dead. She sort of fell limp as I had hold of her. She sank to the ground, and I think some of her clothing must have got caught around her neck in the struggle. I must have strangled her and had sex with her, but I can't recall. Then I must have put her in the alcove. At least, that was Reggie's version. But the truth was very much different. After almost a decade of trial and error, Reg had perfected his murder technique to a fine art. With Ina reclined in the deck chair, although the fire was off, the window was open, 
and the kitchen was bitterly cold. She didn't feel uneasy or unnerved as she sat and calmly chatted to Reg. As underneath her seat, a long rubber hose lay. As in his hand, Reg excitedly fingered a length of rope. Alex was gone. Ina was alone. And soon, she would be his. Being barely lunchtime, it didn't matter that she refused his offer of an alcoholic drink to make her more pliable. Being relatively healthy, it didn't matter that he had no reason to use the square glass jar of Fryer's balsam. And with the truth of her pregnancy being uncertain, there was no evidence whether an attempted abortion took place. But then again, there wasn't with Beryl. As he had done with several other women, Ridge slowly reached behind the kitchen curtain to unhook the bulldog clip on the long rubber hose and unleash a lethal level of invisible and odorless gas. Only this time, Ina saw him. She panicked and she screamed. Desperate to silence her, Ridge dived on top of the flailing woman and pinned her down deep into the deck chair as she punched, kicked and spat with every ounce of her strength. And being a sturdily built woman who was no pushover, Ina was more than a match for this feeble 54-year-old weakling who weighed barely 10 stone and had to hold his breath for fear of being rendered unconscious by the gas underneath. And the more he struggled, the more she fought back. But unlike Ina, Reg had been here before, with Beryl. And having punched Ina hard in the face, as he grabbed his strangling rope and pulled both ends tight, after a minute of fitting and flailing, as her pale skin ruptured red, her nostrils frothed with a bloody spit, and her crossed hazel eyes bulged out of their sockets, as her last ever breath slowly left her lungs, Within a minute, Ina was dead. He stripped her, raped her, tied her ankles and her hands, and dragged her semi-clad corpse into the dark, cramped alcove. Dressed in only a blue bra and pink suspenders, and with no space to lie down, sitting her upright, on her knees, and with her back to the wooden door, he tied her bra around a ceiling hook, so strangely, it looked as if she was praying. And just like the two other bodies in front of her, her knickers were missing, and so was her pubic hair. To the best of our knowledge, John Reginald Halliday Christie had murdered eight different women over one decade, and all at Rillington Place. By Thursday the 19th of March 1953, with a trunk full of dead women's clothes, two bodies buried in the back garden, one rotting under the floorboards, three festering in an alcove, an unholy smell emanating from the drains, a thigh bone holding up the garden fence, a decapitated skull in Kensington Mortuary, and several personal items belonging to his victims having been casually tossed out with the rubbish, along with a small metal tin of Lewis and Burroughs G's linked as pastels. Although Reg could have, he didn't dispose of the bodies or destroy any evidence. Instead, having nailed the alcove door shut, crudely wallpapered over the cracks, and sold anything of any value at the local pawn shops. Being two months behind with his rent, and practically penniless, dressed in a fawn raincoat and a brown trilby hat, he rented out his flat, packed up his brown suitcase, and with Judy on her lead, Reg Christie disappeared into the night, never to return to Ten Rillington Place.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. If you enjoyed parts 1 to 9 of this 10 part series, the concluding part of The Other Side of Ten Rillington Place continues next Thursday with an omnibus edition one week later, as well as a final farewell episode of Murder Mile to mark the end of this series and the podcast. But before that, here's my recommended podcast of the week. Hey guys. Hey y'all. I'm Shelby. I'm Jenny. And we are Wax Tales. Yeah, we're a weekly podcast all about dark mysteries, twisted legends, spooky folklore, and creepy creatures. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and you can find us anywhere podcasts are played pretty much. Yeah. Um, Y'all keep it twisty. That's right. Bye. Hey, Lily. Oh, hey, Krista. Did you know, according to an unproven internet meme, you will cross paths with a murderer 36 times in your lifetime? I did know that, and you want to know why? I can guess. Because we're 36 Times, a Canadian true crime and comedy podcast, which covers crimes in the Great White North. Every episode, we focus on a major crime, and then we lighten things up with a kooky one. We cover everything from major cases and unsolved mysteries to peculiar getaway choices and animals behaving oddly. So catch our bi-weekly episodes on iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts. If my last few sentences have surprised you, and you don't listen to Extra Mile, it's worth listening to last week's show, or checking out my social media pages, as it was on here that I announced the end of this podcast. It's been a good run, but sadly all good things must come to an end. But don't unsubscribe yet, as I'm working on several new podcasts, and they will be announced right here. Murder Mile was research written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult with No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. Hey, hey folks, Michael here, how you doing? You good? You good? 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 Good, you good, you good, is that good, is that good, is that good, that's good, that's good, isn't it? Ah, uh, whoa, got through that one, a um, bit late recording that episode today, it's been a struggle to kind of write this one to get it all done, and then, this morning, oh god, there was two guys outside with some strimmers, they decided to stream in front of my boat for the first couple of hours, so I've been sitting here waiting for them to bugger off. <laughs> It's been really loud. And there's a coot outside getting all moody as well. So, uh, yeah, it's been a bit of a pig. But I, I got through that recording okay, I think. I think it was quite a nice episode as well. A different episode. Uh, I'm trying to make them all different, and this one feels different. So, welcome, everyone. This is Extra Mile. The extra bit at the end of the show where I'll, I'll go into some extra bits uh, that probably weren't included or I'll, uh, kind of clarify some things that I might have glossed over. Uh, but obviously, as always, there's no music, no sound effects, no editing. Uh, even if I get teary, there's no editing. I keep it all in. I know. I didn't. I didn't listen back to last week's episode. I don't think I could. Right. Uh, well, I'm still in the industrial area. I was last time. It's kind of odd because I'm surrounded by factories, but you know, there's a lot of a lot of wildlife around. So there's just gonna open the windows, uh, curtains. Uh, lots of coots outside. Every time I open my door, the coots turn up and they're like, "Give us our food." Uh, so there's coots. There's uh, a couple of more hens. They're really nice. They're tiny. They're like tiny, tiny brown hens with little red flashes on their heads. Uh, there's some ducks who swim around. Ducks are cowards. I can't, can't be asked with ducks. Uh, and there's a heron as well, which is very nice because the canals are a lot cleaner than they used to be in the 70s. The wildlife has come back, so it's nice. You see herons and uh, cormorants sometimes and heron's really nice it's, you know, if you haven't seen a heron it's a huge thing like a like a stork really kind of looks like a stork and it's grey and they sit there and they're very still and thin and it looks like a statue and it's not um, so yeah so it's, it's alright around here it's not too bad I'm going to move on tomorrow anyway because it's time to move on uh, and uh, if you're wondering why I'm not talking about cake I haven't got a cake I'm trying to be on a diet and also, I haven't taken a break to go off and make a cup of tea. I've got a water in front of me. You won't hear me go off and make a cup of tea. Because as soon as I finish this, I'm going into town to uh, post off 
uh, some of the last ever Murder Mile mugs. <gasps> I know, and some Murder Mile cards. I've, I've got about 10 left. I'm not doing any, I'm not making any more Murder Mile mugs because obviously with the show ending, it seems silly to make Murder Mile mugs. So I've got 10 left and people are kind of going, oh, can we have them? Because they realise now, all of a sudden that, you know, they're going to be rare. I think I only made 40 in total. I've got the original, the one, and then uh, I've got 10 left. So they're going now and obviously because i've got loads of badges i before christmas i bought loads of badges i made loads of badges and fridge magnets and stickers and uh uh now i've got loads of them <laughs> i don't really know what to do with them so anyone who buys anything or anyone who buys like one of my thank you cards or anything like that i'm going to throw in loads of extra badges and stuff like that so uh so you, you can enjoy them and you can give them to friends if you like or or just whatever whatever whatever's good uh and then after that after i've been to post office i'm gonna meet up with uh the original uh police constable arsenal guinness um because because it's the final episode of murder mile next week and there's a special part in the end of the episode uh with a policeman and obviously because police constable arsenal guinness is a real official copper uh who solves all of the crime in london he solves ev all the crime everywhere as long as it involves Guinness and Arsenal and ladies with large boo-boos. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to meet up with him, uh, have a cheeky pint and record some lines for the fight. So he's going to have a cameo in next week's show, kind of an, an important role. So I messaged him a couple of weeks ago and said, I would like you to play this role. It's rare. I don't normally give out roles, but I felt I felt it was a good role for him to have. So I've got my new new portable recorder i'm going out in town this will be the new recorder i'll be using in some of the newer podcasts it's a it's a little handheld one it's good quality but uh but it means i can use it outside even on windy days so i'm looking forward to that do something different so let's do some reg stuff right i obviously reg gave that statement i've used he gave multiple statements and uh what i want to do is uh read you reg one of reg's fuller statements about him meeting with hectorina and all that because there's bits obviously as i always say there's bits i i had to i had to deliberately leave out but let's read that i'm not going to do it in reg's voice so um reg said not long after that uh so obviously uh he uh he was talking about kathleen maloney when he says not long after that uh he's as, as we've discussed before his his knowledge of his uh, knowledge of time is is very sketchy he's very sketchy around de details when he wants to be sketchy uh, not long after that i met a man and a woman coming out of a cafe in hammersmith uh, he doesn't mention what the cafe is but apparently it was near the national school on hammersmith broadway which means it would be not too far away from the goldmont uh, palace uh, which we mentioned at the start because uh, christy would go there quite a lot uh I had been there to sign on that day. Uh, it was in the morning. Uh, the man went across the road to talk to a friend. And while he was away, she, i.e. Hectorina McClellan, uh, said that they have to give up their digs. I I've changed that because he actually says diggings. It's a bit of a 1950s term. Uh, originally, if you had a place to live, you'd call it your your diggings, which we now shortened to digs. Some people still don't use digs. Uh, we they said that they had to give up their digs at the weekend he was out of work he was a truck driver uh and then i told her that if they hadn't found anywhere i could put them up for a couple of days they both came up and stayed for a few days he glosses over this quite a lot uh they said that they'd been thrown out of their digs i told them uh that they uh, i told them that they, i told them that they would have to go <coughs> i told them that they would have to go as he was being very unpleasant i've kind of removed this from the story because it throws it off and also we're short on time as well uh he told me that the police were looking for her for some offense which we've uh, mentioned about that's the uh uh hanging around with ron in hyde park when he was selling off the stolen goods from the burglary um when they when they left the man said that if they couldn't find anywhere could they come back that night the girl came back alone she uh, she asked if he had called and I said no, but I was expecting him. She said she would wait, but I advised her not to. Yeah, because that's exactly what Reg does, isn't it? Uh, she insisted on staying in case he came. I told her she couldn't because obviously he's a man of high morals, isn't he? Uh, and, and that he may be looking for her and that she must go and that she couldn't stay here alone. 
She was very funny about it. I got hold of her arm and tried to lead her out. I pushed her out of the kitchen. She started struggling like anything and some of her clothes got torn. It's amazing how that happens, isn't it? Um, she's, she then sort of fell limp. Uh, and as I as I got hold of her, she sank to the ground. And I think some of her clothes must have got caught around her neck in the struggle. It's amazing that th these things just happen, don't they? Um, she was just out of the kitchen in the passageway. I tried to lift her up but couldn't. And then I pulled her into the kitchen and onto the deck chair, the infamous deck chair. I felt her pulse, but it wasn't beating. It's amazing how he remembers certain things, but remembers things a different way. Um... On the, uh, the on her final day, which was the sixth of March. Hang on, why am I jumping to this one? Hang on, I'm reading ahead. Uh, no, let's leave that one. So, um, there were some details I left out about uh, uh, Reg la allowing them to stay in his flat over those three days. Um, there, there was a bit of a conflict there. I've deliberately moved it, removed it out of the episode because it's kind of hard to pin down of exactly what's true and what isn't true. And I just I wanted us to get to out of the story a little bit quicker. So uh, Tuesday, the third of March, nineteen fifty-three. Um, right. Uh, so that's the the uh, uh, Haterina McClellan turns up. Uh, at 7.30pm outside Labrick Grove Tuesday station which we mentioned uh, Hectorina was with her boyfriend Alexander Pomeroy Baker the unemployed lorry driver and she claimed that they were man and wife in her version she, uh, or her version it would be Alex's version Christy was unhappy that she had brought Baker along he said I told you not to tell anyone even your husband they, he assumed it was her husband as I don't want lots of people making inquiries about the flat but still uh, he invited them around the flat, gave them a cup of tea and said that his wife was living next door, which is interesting because Christie has said to different people that his wife was in Birmingham, Sheffield, and here he's saying that she was living next door. But actually she wasn't. She was dead under the floorboards and that he had sent his furniture away and that he was going to live elsewhere as well. Uh, he had said that he's, he'd quit his job at uh, Birmingham Road, uh, Birmingham Road Services, British Road Services, uh, and that he'd been offered a better job which was a lie and that he was taking a little holiday before he went away which was a lie it, 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 his lies are totally out of control um christy showed ina and alex the front room uh, uh the bedroom and the kitchen uh and he said he got i was just said he said he got a transfer and he was going to go away interestingly when they were looking around the flat alex said that all of the doors were locked on the downstairs and that christy would open each door show them in and then lock the door behind them when he would leave in every single room every single room was locked even though in some of them like the front room it was entirely empty um now obviously after that point uh, they went back to Ivor elliott's house at uh hotley road in shepherd's bush which was locked so they had no choice they had to come back to christy's house <coughs> and as already uh written they returned between 1 and 2 a.m. Christie wasn't expected them. They apologised and said their landlord had turfed them out. All three of them spent the night sitting in the kitchen. Eno on the deck chair. Uh, Christie put a cloth over the bucket of coal and sat on that. And Alex was sitting on the footstool that normally Alex, uh, that normally Christie sits on. So the next night, this I took this bit out of the story because it, it slowed it down. And it's... It, yeah. Um... Ina slept in the deck chair, so that was the only really comfortable chair to sit on. Christy was in the kitchen too. Alex Baker, her boyfriend, said Christy would not let him and Ina sleep together. He kept going on about how he was, you know, a, a moral person and, you know, a decent person, and you can't have them because he, he found out they weren't married and, you know, couldn't have them sharing a room together or sleeping in the same room together. So he insisted that Baker, um, sorry, Alex Baker slept in the back room. Uh, on the uh, the the pile of clothes that Christie had been sleeping on previously, uh, he said it was really dirty in there. It was in really bad bad condition, and Christie shared the kitchen with Ina. Whether this is true or not, we don't know. But this is this is what Alex Baker said. Uh, Alex was very dubious. He asked Ina if Christie had interfered with her. He didn't trust Christie at all. She said he hadn't. 
Um, obviously, Christy said uh, uh, they could stay uh, until the Friday if they hadn't found anywhere. Uh, and he claimed that he was using his own food rations to, to feed them, even though he was starving himself. Um, but he said that he didn't like ba uh, Alex Baker. Um, and he, because Alex Baker, he said, seemed moody and rude. Uh, but obviously how much more of this was actually Christy just really trying to split the two of them apart, uh, split Ina and Alex apart so he could get them apart, uh, which ultimately he did. So why she, why she went back to his flat, we don't know. There is a suggestion that she was a prostitute, that she was trying to earn money, and that's why she went back to have sex with Christy to earn some money, and that, that was the... But, do you know, whether she was actually a prostitute, we don't know. She didn't have any convictions for that. There were no witness statements... Like with the other victims, Joe, clearly we've gone through all those and I can point to many, many witness statements where they go. Like um, with Kathleen Maloney, so many statements of people who said that they worked with her as a prostitute. This was where she picked people up, blah, blah, blah that kind of thing. With Hectorina McClellan, there's nothing. There's none of that. The only real statement we have is from Ron, who said that when they saw Christy in that cafe... Uh, and he was looking at him, that Ina had said uh, she had given him a bad time once, which is a suggestion that maybe she was a prostitute. But whether that's true, we don't actually know. We really don't know. So, um, uh, when the body was finally found, uh, obviously there's three bodies in the little alcove now. It's a small alco alcove. You can't stand up in, up in it. Um, uh, so Ina was in uh, a, a sitting upright position, even in the kind of kneeling upright position. That's still basically covers the height and the width of the alcove it's really small um so she was sitting upright um she was kept in that position by her bra as ma mentioned basically uh there was a hook in the ceiling in the ceiling of the alcove he tied her around that so basically uh when she was finally found she was seen it looked like she was sitting upright it's quite quite an unnerving photo i'll try and post that online um and her back was to the door uh, there was a there was a little bit of a blanket round round her feet in the middle of her body, but that was really all there was. Um, it it is said that she died of asphyxiation, open to, uh, died of asphyxiation owing to carbon monoxide poisoning, and strangulation. Although uh, her strangulation uh, her carbon monoxide level was thirty six percent, and a fatal dose of that is between forty and fifty. So as with the other women, it looks like she was either semi-conscious or barely conscious or unconscious uh, when she was strangled uh, as with the others as well there was evidence of sperm in her vagina um, it, whether she had sex with Christy before or after is uncertain but with the the pathology does kind of suggest that it was after so whether she was alive or dead when he raped her we absolutely don't know um she was wearing a blue bra obviously the the bra was pulled up her breasts were exposed as she was being hung from there uh he'd removed all of her clothes as mentioned except for her knickers her knickers and as with the others her pubic hair had been removed uh, there were scratch marks along the lower part of her back, which suggested that he dragged her into the alcove. Um, and uh, her skin was swollen, her eyes were hemorrhaged, and when they finally found her, there was mould growing out of her nostrils and her mouth. Um, as with all of the women who were found, blood samples were taken, uh, stomach contents were checked. Uh, Ina hadn't, like, as with the others, hadn't eaten in a day as well. Uh, and... They also did uh, vaginal and rectal swabs as well, just to make sure. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, uh, yeah, no, uh, absolutely no uh, hint of alcohol in there. So I mentioned that she didn't drink, but uh, she, she wasn't much of a drinker anyway, as far as we know. But she had no alcohol content in her system, so he hadn't given her any alcohol. Uh, and I think that is it for that one. That's all the real details. Do you know what? Only because next week's episode, obviously, uh, that was the end of episode nine. And you're probably thinking, oh, I bet Christy gets arrested. I bet the police kick down his door and they go, shut it, chammy. And then they pin him to the floor. But they didn't. Uh, so that was episode nine. What you see is Christy poor, uh, hungry, ill 
loads of bodies in his house, loads of evidence. Uh, he's just rented out the flat and he just gets up, gets up and leaves. That's the end. He's got no reason to be there anymore. He doesn't get rid of the evidence. So you see him walking away. So what I'm going to do next week, it'll be the final episode. What we'll do is we'll go back into Christie's history and we'll dive through all of the moments in his history, all the interesting stuff, and we'll clarify a lot of details that we've already done. We won't go through all the murders again, but I'll allude to them all, so you might need to get your, your thinking caps on for that. And then we will do the end of Christie's story. We, we will uh, entirely wrap it up. And hopefully it'll be uh, uh, an interesting ending. I know how it ends, but... Uh, God, I'm going to have to hope that I can get all the details in there because there's a lot. There's a bloody lot of details in there. Uh, so that will be uh, the end. Huzzah. Uh, so uh, before we go, I just want to thank everyone for your kind words. Do you know, I've obviously, um, uh, I said uh, it was the farewell of Murder Mile last week. Um, uh, I got, got a little bit emotional during the uh, saying goodbye. Do you know it was interesting? It was kind of saying all my big goodbyes. You could, t if you listen to it, you could tell that I'm not. You know, I'm sad about saying goodbye to Murder Mile because you know it's it's in total. It all has taken me about four years to make all this, and the podcast's doing really well. And you know, it's finally getting off the ground. And but you know, my reasons are there why I need to end this. I can't keep doing it. But it was only when I I. I was saying thank you to you guys. That that was the reason why I got upset. Was at that moment. So uh, everyone's been really lovely, lovely kind words. Very much appreciated. Uh, really, everyone everyone sent me some really lovely message messages, which has been great. They've been very heartwarming. And uh, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm very sad to leave Murder Mile, but I think all of, all of you have kind of right rightly nailed it as well. That you know, it is the right thing to do. You know, end on a high. Uh, I'm kind of. I still like Murder Mile, but it's just it's 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 dominating my life, and I just I don't I don't want to really want to keep doing it at this level uh, because I'll start resenting it. I'll start resenting the podcast, and I'll start hating it, and the quality will drop. And what's the point? What's the point in doing that? So you, you know, maybe one day it might return. Who knows? But I need to do something else at the moment, uh, and that's what I'm working on now. So we'll get this final episode done. We'll do the omnibus edition. We'll do the farewell episode. Oh, farewell episode. If anyone has any questions you want to ask me, this will be the last chance. <gasps> so uh, message me on any of the forums. Uh, just uh, title it on no Q&A question or something. Uh, and just uh, I'll try and an answer as many questions as possible in the farewell episode. Uh, so obviously I, I've mentioned uh, don't un unsubscribe to this channel yet even though we've got a couple of episodes, episodes still to go um, what I'll do uh, 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 January 31st is when Murder Mile will officially kind of finish what I'll do uh, w the, you won't have anything coming through that channel for a while but when I'm ready to launch the new podcast what i'll do is i'll do a little kind of promo episode and i'll put some links in there and it will be in your murder mile channel so uh, don't unsubscribe it it won't clog up your your phone or anything i won't send anything through i won't annoy you with things every single week but the next one you'll get will be an introduction to the new podcast so uh i can't give you any names yet deliberately because if i give you names of the podcast now you'll go searching for it and then you go i can't find it and it's like yes of course you can't find it because i haven't I haven't written them and i haven't made them and there's there's no um there's no uh what am i waiting what am i uh links there's no link out there for you to get to so i'm going when i announce it is the point at which it will all be ready so you can literally go oh that sounds good and go straight to it and subscribe so it might take me about six to eight weeks, I reckon. I'm going to have to take a little bit of time off to relax because I need to do that. Work on the new episode and then move on from there. But um, my plan is to do lots of different podcasts. Uh, they're all going to be very different. Um, the idea is to have them all full of the things that you love about Murder Mile and the things I love as well. Um, but I'm going to reiterate this again. It's not going to be Murder Mile. It's going to be nothing like Murder Mile. Don't expect it to be murder mile. Don't expect true crime. It's going to be none of that. None of that is going to be there, but it's going to be hopefully things that you'll enjoy. But they're all going to be very different podcasts. So um, 
I'm going to try and roll out a couple of different podcasts across a series of months. The idea, hopefully, that I want to do is do um, roll out the first podcast and then three to four months later, if that's going well and it's a weekly podcast, then roll out another one as well. I want to try and work smarter, not harder. That's the, the way of doing it. So some of them will be storytelling. So you might listen to the first one. I go, mm, it's not really for me. The next one will be a corner kind of more of a factual one so that might be more for you um some of them might be kind of like the first part of murder mile might become a little bit more controlled do you know with uh, uh storytelling and music and sounds but then other ones are going to be a little bit more extra miley a bit a little bit more free form so if you don't like the first one you might like the second one or you might like the third one but they're not going to be a carbon copy of murder mile i've learned from my mistakes with murder mile and what i'm going to do is very specific podcasts that fit into a nice mold because murder mile doesn't it's kind of it's true crime and it's comedy and it's drama and you know it's a bit of it's a bit of a mess to be honest whereas i want to create podcasts individual podcasts that are really succinct so people come straight in and go oh i know what this is like from minute one you go oh, i know what this is and i can enjoy this so that's what i'm going to be doing uh, they're all going to be good quality. They're all going to be easy to produce. I'm drawing, don't worry, I'm drawing a big list for myself of do's and don'ts. Such as working nine to five, working Monday to Friday, never working Saturdays. And on Sundays I do my tours and then that's it. So it's f not five days a week, not seven days a week. Do you know, 10 to 12 hours a day or, do you know, something something decent, not 16 hours a day. So smarter, not harder. Uh, so, yeah, so hopefully I'll be able to produce loads of uh, interesting podcasts for you to enjoy. The first one, um, I, I met up with my podcast host the other week, pitched five ideas. Uh, interesting there. They, they, the, the first one, they were like, that's clearly the one you're passionate about, so you should do that. Great, so I'm going to get working on that one. Uh one of the ideas I really thought they wouldn't go with, I thought it was a little bit, I didn't think it would work for them. Actually, they were like, they were like, we really like that idea and actually that could really work for us. So that could be interesting. Uh, the first one will be a, a weekly podcast, I think. I'll do it as a weekly podcast. Um, I might do one that's a fortnightly podcast as well. I'm just trying to do things that are different. And one of them, which I think you'll be uh, happy, uh, enjoy, instead of like getting a Murder Mile podcast once every Thursday, if I'm doing a podcast, so the first one goes out on a Thursday, let's say, and then I do another one on a Tuesday, which is great for you. You get two pod podcasts a week. One of them that I might be doing that they're interested in is a daily podcast. So you might get me every single day. But the idea is, I'm going to plan it out very carefully so I make sure I don't burn myself out and I don't have too much to do. It's working nine to five, Monday to Friday, and that's it, and then we quit. Uh, and if I can get them off the ground and do it really well, then I can get someone in to help me out, do, you know, get someone to do the bulk of the editing for me or do some research for me. That'd be good. So that's the future. So even though it's sad that we're saying goodbye to um, Murder Mile, we are saying hello to new things. Hello. We're saying hello to new things. <laughs> new things, new exciting things. Do you know it's time to move on? It's you, you don't want to get oh, I don't want to get stuck in a rut. So yeah, new exciting things. I'm very excited about about the new ideas. So um so that's it. I'm now off to the post office to send away some mugs and some uh farewell treats, some uh, uh cards, which I've got extra badges in. And uh, off to see Police Constable Arsenal Guinness or the Metropolitan Plot. So, <laughs> hope, hope, you, hope you're all well. And I will see you next week for uh, The Other Side of Ten Millington Place, Part 10. Ooh.